Good morning. How's everybody doing? It's been many months since I have read. I'm so glad to be back with you guys. Thank you for reaching out. Today I'm going to begin at module number six, which begins on page 160. Module number six, The Cell. Are you ready? Let's go. Introduction. In module one, we started talking about the cell, and we really haven't stopped talking about it since. Indeed, in modules number two and number three, you learned quite a bit about the cell structures that exist in kingdoms Protista and Monera. Well, believe it or not, we have barely scratched the surface of all that can be learned about the cell. That's why we are now going to devote an entire module to learning about its structure and functions. Since we have already studied Kingdom Monera, however, we will not spend any time on prokaryotic cells. This module will concentrate entirely on eukaryotic cells. Take heed that there is a lot of information in this module you will want to spend an extra week or so studying it in order to be able to absorb all of the information that it contains. Now, please understand what we mean by that. Don't take three weeks reading the module. It is not a lot longer than other modules in this course. Instead, plan to spend an extra week just studying the information in this module especially making sure to learn all of the vocabulary words. Vocabulary is an important part of biology, and in this module, it is especially important. Since cells are the basic building blocks of life, it's not surprising that we need to study them in detail. What might surprise you, however, is that you have already studied the most diverse eukaryotic cells that exist, those in Kingdom Protista, and, to a lesser extent, those in Kingdom Fungi. In the last two kingdoms, Animalia and Plantae, there is not nearly as much diversity among cells. All of the incredibly diverse organisms in these two kingdoms are built from cells that have very similar blueprints. Cellular Functions in the process of life, cells must carry on several different functions. First of all, they must maintain enough energy to live and perform the duties for which God has designed them. To maintain energy, cells must perform three basic functions. Absorption, the transport of dissolved substances into cells. Digestion, the breakdown of absorbed substances. Respiration, the breakdown of food molecules with a release of energy. In absorption, dissolved substances must enter the cell from the outside. This is actually more complicated than it sounds because cells cannot just let anything inside them. After all, some substances are poisons that would immediately kill the cell if they were allowed to enter to any great extent. As a result, absorption is a complicated process in which the cell recognizes the substances that are trying to enter. Useful substances are allowed in, while harmful substances are not. Of course, the system is not perfect so some toxic substances do get inside the cell. Nevertheless, the plasma membrane has a lot of chemical machinery designed to stop many toxic substances from entering. Although their definitions seem rather similar, there's a big difference between digestion and respiration. In digestion, large molecules are broken down into smaller ones. For example, when polysaccharides are broken down into monosaccharides, we call this digestion. As we mentioned in module number five, this has to happen 
because most organisms can only use energy from the breakdown of monosaccharides. When a cell actually breaks down the monosaccharides and produces energy, however, we call that respiration. There are two reasons that we cannot lump digestion and respiration together. First, they usually occur in different places within an organism or a cell. Second, the products of digestion can be used for other processes besides just respiration. For example, when proteins are digested, they're broken down into their constituent amino acids. Instead of being used for respiration, these amino acids can be used by the cells to produce more proteins. In this case, digestion is used to provide the building blocks of biosynthesis, a cellular function we discussed in the previous module. Going back to the terminology you learned in module one, digestion and respiration are both a part of the cell's catabolism, while biosynthesis is a part of the cell's anabolism. Since a cell absorbs substances from the outside environment, it makes sense that at some point it must eliminate excess substances as well. There are three methods by which cells eliminate substances. Excretion, the removal of soluble waste materials. Egestion, the removal of non-soluble waste materials. And secretion, the release of biosynthesized substances. Once again, even though these definitions look similar, they describe completely different processes. If a substance can be dissolved in a fluid, it is called soluble. Thus, excretion involves the removal of substances that can be dissolved in the fluids of a cell. On the other hand, egestion involves the removal of substances that cannot be dissolved in the fluids of a cell. Egestion is a much more difficult process than excretion. Why? Well, think of experiment 5.1. When you put solid, undissolved sugar in a napkin, the sugar could not leave the napkin. Once water seeped into the napkin and dissolved the sugar, however, the sugar molecules could diffuse right through the napkin. Thus, transporting soluble substances is simpler than transporting non-soluble ones. Finally, secretion does not involve removal of waste at all. Instead, it involves the removal of useful substances that the cell has manufactured for other cells. Cells also must perform functions of movement and irritability. When we say movement, we might mean the actual locomotion of a cell from one point to another, or we might mean movement of things within a cell. Also, when we say irritability, we do not mean that the cell must get cranky from time to time. <laughs> Instead, biologists use this term to mean sensing and responding to changes in the surroundings. In order for a cell to continue its existence, there are two other functions that it must perform. Homeostasis, maintaining the status quo, and reproduction, producing more cells. In order to survive, the cell must make sure that all of its organelles are functioning properly, that all organelles are supplied with the substances that they need, and that everything within the cell is running according to God's design. This is called homeostasis. In addition, all cells die. 
Thus, in order to maintain life, cells must produce other cells by reproduction. In fact, the last sentence in the previous paragraph is another reason why we think that abiogenesis could never happen. You see, scientists have been studying cells in one way or another since the 1600s. In the last century, century, especially, an enormous amount of scientific resources have been devoted to studying cells. In fact, the science of studying cells has become so fundamental that we have a name for it. Cytology. Cytology, the study of cells. Well, in the entire history of cytology, scientists have seen cells produced in only one way, from other cells. Never have chemicals or any other non-living substances produced cells. In fact, scientists cannot even produce cells in the lab unless they have a living cell to start with. Even the process of cloning starts with a living cell. Without that living cell, cloning would not work. If, in the history of cytology, Scientists have only seen cells produced by other cells. Why in the world would some scientists want to believe that cells could have been produced in a different way at some time in the past? Summing up then, cells must perform at least 11 main functions in order to support and maintain life. Absorption, digestion, respiration, biosynthesis, excretion, egestion, secretion, movement, irritability, homeostasis, and reproduction. Interestingly enough, in the single-celled organisms that you studied in Kingdom Protista, all of these functions were performed by a single cell. In the multicellular life forms that you studied in Kingdom Fungi and that you will study in the next semester of this course, these functions are performed by different groups of cells. Some cells have been designed to specialize in certain functions, while others have been designed to specialize in other functions. As a result, in multicellular organisms, most of the cells do not perform all of the processes listed. Instead, the functions have been assigned to certain groups of cells, and the individual groups of cells work together to make sure all of the above listed functions are performed. This brings up an interesting point that we have already emphasized, but cannot emphasize enough. There is no such thing as a simple life form. Biologists are fond of calling the organisms in kingdoms Protista and Monera simple because they mostly consist of only a single cell. However, in some ways, these organisms are more complex than those in other kingdoms. Certainly, having several cells working together and specializing in different life functions adds a level of complexity to the organism. However, since the cells need not perform all functions associated with life, they need not be as sophisticated as a single cell that must perform all of life's functions. Thus, multicellular organisms are certainly more complex when you look at them as a whole. But when you focus in on one cell, Single-celled organisms <clears throat> could be considered more complex. In the end, then, there is nothing simple about life, not even when it is composed of a single cell. Cell structure. Once we get through the cells in kingdoms Protista and Monera, we generally lump 
We generally lump the remaining cells into two distinct categories, plant cells and animal cells. Schematic, idealized examples of a plant cell and an animal cell are shown in figure 6.1. Before we discuss the individual components of a cell, we need to discuss size. As the legend in figure 6.1 indicates, most cells are just a little less than 10 micrometers across. As we mentioned in module number two, a micrometer is one millionth of a meter. Now, if you aren't familiar with the metric system, don't worry about it. When you study chemistry, you'll learn it in detail. For right now, just realize that about 2,000 cells can fit across your fingernail. That should give you an idea of how small a cell is. It turns out that cells are small for a reason. You see, the volume of materials in a cell increases with the cube of the radius of the cell. If you haven't had geometry yet, that phrase might be a little mystifying to you. Don't worry. What it means is that when the distance across the cell doubles, the cell's volume, the amount it holds, goes up by a factor of eight. Well, when a cell's volume increases, it must absorb more nutrients to survive. The amount of nutrients it must absorb actually depends on its volume. Thus, when the distance across a cell doubles, its absorption must increase by a factor of eight. Since the amount of absorption that a cell needs is so dramatically dependent on the cell size, there's a fundamental size limit for cells. After that point, they cannot grow any larger. That's why cells are so small. The cell wall. One of the major distinctions between plant cells and animal cells can be found on the outside of the cells. Plant cells usually have a cell wall and animal cells do not. Cell wall, a rigid structure on the outside of certain cells, usually plant and bacteria cells. The cell wall is typically made of cellulose and pectin, a carbohydrate that hardens cellulose. These materials are secreted by organelles in the cell. Although the main function of the cell wall is to protect the cell from its surroundings, the cell wall is full of small holes called pores. These pores allow substances like nutrients to diffuse through the cell wall and into the cell. They also allow waste products from the cell to diffuse into the cell surroundings. As, plant cell, as a plant cell grows, the cell wall must grow along with it. Thus, as a plant cell is maturing, the cell wall needs to be rather flexible so as to allow for the growth. Once a plant cell has matured and stopped growing, however, there's no longer any need for the cell wall to be flexible. Therefore, at that time, the cell starts producing secondary cell walls. These walls are formed on the inside of the original cell wall and are much more rigid, providing better protection for the contents of the cell. Once the secondary cell walls are formed, the original cell wall is usually referred to as the primary cell wall. A single plant, of course, has many, many cells. These cells are usually arranged adjacent to one another, separated by a thin film called the middle lamella. Middle lamella. The thin film between the cell walls of adjacent plant cells. The middle lamella is made primarily of pectin. Besides plant cells, many bacteria and algae have cell walls. 
It is important, however, to note that the cell wall of a bacterium is chemically different from what we have discussed here. Thus, this discussion is specifically for plant cells. In addition, some cells have structures that substitute or add to the cell wall. For example, you learned in module number two that in addition to a cell wall, some bacteria form a capsule that surrounds the cell wall and adds protection. A few bacteria have a capsule and no cell wall. Also, some bacteria have neither cell wall nor capsule. Finally, in module number three, you learn that a euglena has a pellicle, which functions much like a cell wall, but is thinner and more flexible. That's the end of module six, part one. See you for part two very soon. God bless you.